All right, good morning, good morning. Uh, I am attempting to go live, and we'll see if this works. I don't, I don't know if I'm live or not. Do you see me at all on Facebook on regular? Okay, I am going. All right. Well, good morning. Ah, good, now I can share it to the church's page. All right, let me get this going here. No, I don't want to change it. There. All right, now we're set up and going. Facebook is being odd and strange, and I might just have to do more of the, the live stuff from my own personal Facebook page instead of the, uh, the church one. But I've just shared it to the church, so hopefully people can see it either here or there. We are now out of the season of Easter. So we are going to be returning to the simple morning uh, daily prayer, page 295. And I'm also going to reintroduce and get back into going over the catechism. So we'll look at the first commandment today, as noted up on the board back there. <laughs> back there. Um, so uh, once again, the simple order of devotion. Uh-oh, you can't hear me. Can anyone else hear me? Or is Roger the only one who can't hear me? Can anyone else hear me? Huh, well, I, I don't know. Facebook is being weird. So we'll try this and see how it works and maybe it'll work and okay. Check on your end, Roger. I'm not sure what it is. We'll see. Well, it's all crazy. But I'm wearing my Hawaiian shirt, and it's nice and cool. Well, warm out, and I'm going to relax today. I think I might get a new iPad, too, to have a better camera coming this way. But we'll see. So, page 295, Morning Devotion. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. In the morning, O Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. My mouth is filled with your praise and with your glory all the day. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our psalm for today is Psalm 128. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. You shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands. You shall be blessed, shall be well with you. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. Behold, and thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. The Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. May you see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our reading for today is going to be Luke chapter 22, verses 1 through 23. Now, the Feast of Unleavened Bread drew near, which is called the Passover. And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to put him to death, for they feared the people. Then Satan entered into Judas, called Iscariot, who was one of the number of the twelve. He went away and conferred with the chief priests and officers how he might betray him to them. And they were glad and agreed to give him money. So he consented and sought an opportunity to betray him to them in the absence of a crowd. Then came the day excuse me, of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat it. They said to him, Where will you have us prepare it? <clears throat> he said to them, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters, and tell the master of the house, The teacher says to you, Where is the guest room? where I may eat the Passover with my disciples. And he will show you a large upper room furnished. Prepare it there. And they went and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. 
And when the hour came, he reclined at table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you that I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And when they began to question one another, uh, and they began to question one another, which of them it could be who was going to do this? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Um, oh yeah, I don't, I don't get to sing forever, O Lord. Now I just get to talk. Uh, here we have the start of the Passion, really, uh, the account in Luke. And Luke brings up a few things that would be very interesting to uh, Gentile hearers who were out and about in greater, the greater Mediterranean. Um, one of those is where the Passover is celebrated. Now, we're used to the idea of the upper room. We, we, we get the idea. But that would have been how and where they most likely met for church. Um, you didn't have public buildings. You would have one person who was faithful, and the disciples would go up, and they would gather in uh, a guest room. When we hear the word house church, it's not just a few people gathering in their living room. Oh, we'll just have church. No, it, it would be one of the wealthier people who was a member of the church would host the church, and he'd have a room set aside. It, it would almost be like barn church. Not that I'm hoping this would happen, but let's say there were some sort of accident or fire at the church where our property is out for a goodly while and we need to rebuild it. We could probably go meet in someone's barn. I, I mean, we've got enough farmers where I'm sure someone could clear off an empty space and we could gather there. That's the idea here, that, that you'd be meeting in the personal space of, of a host. And that was the way that the people hearing Luke's gospel would have been used to worshiping. So the idea that, that in this supper, in this meal that we are celebrating here at church, Christ is present just as he was present with the disciples the day of his crucifixion, but we're just on the other side of the crucifixion and resurrection, and we still get the same Jesus. And we get his forgiveness. And so that's that, that beautiful tie. That, that, that what the church has, even after the ascension, we, we haven't lost Jesus. Jesus is still with us here in his teaching and in his supper. The teacher needs it. Well, the teaching of Jesus still goes on through the preaching of the word. And Jesus still comes to us in his own body and blood. It's all good. We don't lack anything. And uh, here you have the institution of the Lord's Supper. Uh, some people say, well, you know, Jesus isn't saying the same things that he does other places. This is one of the things that is common. Um, sometimes, I shouldn't say sometimes, often in the ancient world, their idea of quotations weren't quite the same as ours. And one of the things that would be quite common, especially in uh, introductory religious texts, is that you would not give full quotes. And Luke's Gospel is meant to be an introductory text. Um, and the reason for that is if you give the full quote, people go off and do their own stuff and try to do the rites on their own. Uh, this is one of the things that comes up. You see this in Leviticus, where things are not spelled out in detail. Well, why aren't they spelled out in detail? Because we don't want people to go off and try and do it on their own. It's later on in 1 Corinthians when Paul is doing correcting, where he gives the full uh, text of the, the words of institution that line up with the other gospels. So that's part of what's going on here, that there's a, a purpose for this. And sometimes they don't give us every detail simply because we don't need to be focused on, on all that at the moment. It's a, a complicated thing writing the scripture. I, I get this a bit when preaching a text. Uh, a pastor I love and respect, Dave Nairink, who's down at Trinity Norman, was my pastor while I was in college and had vicars over and over and over again. 
uh, likes to say that you should preach the entirety of the text. I think that takes too long. Um, I, I don't get through every single point that I could make in the text because I don't want to keep you for an hour and a half. Nor do I want to rush through all the points to get in them. I will preach on the points that are main and that stand up for the day. Like yesterday, I, on Pentecost, I preached on the importance of words. There's other angles, other things I could pull out of those texts. The fulfillment of Scripture is a main one for me. Uh, the, the whole idea of what does the peace of God look like, that could have been a main focus. There's, the text is rich, and you pull out different things that is needed for the day. So, But that's my thought there. Um, really. Luke's passion is one I don't get to do much, um, simply because on Palm Sunday we read Matthew's passion. And on Good Friday, we read John's Passion. Uh, Mark and Luke are supposed to be read on the Monday and Tuesday of Holy Week when we don't have service. So, um, or it might be Tuesday and Wednesday. I can't remember. At some point during that. So, what we're going to do now is we're going to look at our catechism lesson for the day. And if you don't have a catechism on you at the moment should be able to find one. But for today, this is the one that I expect everyone to have memorized. The first commandment and its meaning. What is the first commandment? You shall have no other God. I will also accept thou shalt have no other gods before me. I learned the old translation. What does this mean? We should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. When we... <clears throat> When we think of, of what is ideal, how, what, what are we supposed to be doing? We're to rightly fear God, rightly love God, and rightly trust God. And the problem is with those words, fear and love, there are so many meanings that we have attached to them today in society. In English, what does love mean? In fact, in Greek, there were four different words for love, and there are multiple words for fear. The idea of fear is not terror. It's not phobia. We're not supposed to be theophobic. Oh, no, it's gone. Hi, I can't. No, it, it's to, to rightly respect and recognize power. If you fear something, you rightly understand its power. For example, uh, you should have a fear of the electrical outlet. Not that you are afraid of it and can't go near it, but you should have a right and proper respect of the power that it contains so that you deal with it properly. I will plug in my phone there, but I will not stick a fork in it. That, that, that's the idea of fear. And it really is dealing with the idea of power. And to fear God is to understand that of all the things to respect, of all the powers out there, of all the things that could impact your life, that you ought not go against and use improperly, or go against or not relate to properly, the highest of those is God. That's the idea. It, it, this is really about ranking priorities of, of respect. So often, listen to this, listen, to, listen for it today. How often are people trying to bend your fear to where they, where they want you to change whom you respect or change whom you trust in to keep you away from some phobia, some, some wild fear, all right? So that's the idea of fearing God above all things. Also, love, it's important to remember that when the Bible talks about love, rarely is it talking about emotion. Uh, th this is before all the romantics come out. I, I'm a romantic at heart. I love the romantics, but that's not what Scripture's talking about. The idea here is service or even charity, caritas, agape. 
Whom do you make your actions serve? That's what it is to love. I love my kids, therefore I have actions that are meant to serve them, even though I might not rather do them. The, we all have things that we serve, all things that we love, that we devote attention to. And yet the highest, the most important, the source of all these gifts that we do love, and the one that should be rightly organized, is God. I can't set my love for my children against my love for God. And if my children are trying to say, well, Dad, if you really loved us, you wouldn't take us to church. Uh, no, that's a misordering of things. Be because I love God and because I love you, congratulations, you're coming to church. And then the final one is trust. Um, one of the things that you'll note for the rest of the commandments is they don't bring up trust again. All the other meanings begin, we should fear and love God so that. Trust really is faith. That's what faith is. It is to trust. And what we, what we do, what we realize, is that there, this does not mean that we don't trust other people, but our highest trust has to be in God, even trust above ourselves. And that's that, that idea. That, that we rightly understand that God is in charge, that we were created to serve him, and that he is the one who provides our good things. And all sin, all, all ways in which we fall short, involves with misfearing and misloving in a way that it drives us to put our trust elsewhere. So, that's the first commandment. Now, interestingly enough, you would note, perhaps, from yesterday that Jesus goes to the cross and he says so because he loves the Father. He rightly serves the Father. Jesus fulfills all of this. If you want to see what perfect fear, love, and trust looks like, you look at Jesus. So, having said that, it's time for us to pray. So we'll pray the Lord's Prayer. Oh, wait, no, we do the Apostles' Creed. Let's confess the Apostles' Creed. Got to get back on track. We'll confess the Apostles' Creed and then pray the Lord's Prayer and a few other prayers and be on our way. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the many gifts you've poured out upon us. And we ask that you grant us your wisdom, your spirit, so that we might rightly use these gifts. That we might... Uh, fear you, that we might love you and serve you, and that we might trust you. Be with us this day as we go about the task that you have given us. Help us to love the neighbors you have placed into our lives, and help us to use the talents you have given us in their service and your service thereby. Uh, keep us safe in our comings and goings. Be with those who are fighting against ill health. Uh, grant them relief. Bless the doctors and nurses who are attending them, that they might uh, have a recovery in accordance with your will. This we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Prayer of the day. O God, who gave your Holy Spirit to the apostles, grant us the same Spirit, that we may live in faith and abide in peace. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The concluding prayers. Almighty God, merciful Father, who created and completed all things, on this day when the work of our calling begins anew, 
we implore you to create its beginning, direct its continuance, and bless its end, that our doings may be preserved from sin, our life sanctified, and our work this day be well-pleasing to you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Have a good day, everybody.